joining us, everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on Salt Lake Center of Opportunity Partnership, uh, which is a small business assistance program coordinated by Salt Lake County. So for the agenda um, of this webinar, uh, we'll go through some basic information about the co-op program, highlight some key dates in the application and the program launch process, and we'll go over some steps for submitting the application, and we should have some, uh, should have plenty of time at the end uh, for some questions and answers to make sure that um, everything is answered on your end. So why co-op? Uh, small businesses across the county don't always enjoy the same access to entrepreneurial resources that they need to achieve their potential. Um, and we found and research does support that this is especially true for businesses from communities uh, that experience economic uh, opportunity gaps. And these are what we call opportunity businesses. And you'll hear us uh, throw this term around a lot. So to kind of double click on that term. So what are opportunity businesses? This is certainly not an exhaustive list, um, but opportunity businesses do include uh, those that are from communities that are Black, Latinx, Native American, Asian and Pacific Islander, subcontinent Asian American, or uh, yeah, women, LGBTQ+, uh, people with disabilities, um, and those otherwise socially in or economically disadvantaged, um, which does include certain geographies uh, in the county that experience the lower economic opportunity. Co-op is actually an extension and expansion of a program that the county has been running uh, since about April of last year. And so that one had an initial focus of getting um, PPP money to small businesses that needed it. Um, and so while that initial focus was on kind of getting businesses that COVID recovery funding uh, became clear, especially as that assistance uh, got more and more depleted, that the needs from these businesses were, were broader than just getting that funding. Uh, so to give you a sense of kind of the communities that we serve through ICAP and the resource needs that we did uncover, we had 11 total partners, which included various community-based organizations, uh, some chambers of commerce and uh, business centers. And you can see here, many of their needs revolved around things like business creation and marketing, um, web development and support, accounting and bookkeeping, uh, and grant application assistance. So what is gonna be new with co-op? We've kind of learned that there are three, essentially three players here. Um, the opportunity businesses, the resources that are needed by these businesses, and the community-based organizations that act as kind of the connection or the glue between the two. Uh, Alec, can you advance a couple slides? So essentially the opportunity businesses, which we mentioned before, are these small businesses from those communities facing lower economic opportunity. Um, and then the resources are these uh, service providers that offer services, whether that be around bookkeeping or legal support, um, maybe it's permitting, um, web support that we mentioned, um, marketing, et cetera. And then the community-based organizations being those kind of chambers of commerce and community partners that have those strong existing relationships in those communities that we're seeking to serve. I'm sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties with the slides. Yeah, Ali, if you're having computer issues, I can jump on and share slides too. All right, let's see if I can do that for us. I should mention also, this is being recorded. So if 
at any point you want to be able to go back and uh, review anything we've covered here, this will be posted on our co-op website. And so you can feel free to go back and rewatch the recording or share with anyone that maybe wasn't able to attend today. Brooke, is the story you want to be or should I continue That's going? That's great. Uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide, actually. That'd be great. Thanks, Devin. So we see our role at the county to help connect with these community-based organizations, what we're calling business outreach, to the resources, which we're calling business services, in order to create an ecosystem that better serves opportunity businesses. So you can kind of see, hopefully with this graphic, um, this platform approach that we're taking to create an ecosystem where each community has that direct connection and relationship with the business services that are needed to su support the small businesses in their community. Next slide. Um, this is a breakdown of how we at the county are thinking about the two different types of partners uh, that will be involved in co-op. So on the business outreach side, these partners are going to hire individuals that we're calling navigators to engage opportunity businesses, understand their needs, and connect them with those resources uh, that they need to be in touch with. Um, and many of those resources will be provided by the co-op business services partners. And so on the flip side, those business services partners are going to work directly with those navigators uh, and the businesses themselves, of course, uh, to more deeply understand their needs um, and provide that relevant assistance to the businesses. Um, and our focus is really on increasing capacity for some of those existing uh, resources that have proven to be really valuable uh, and also seek out what gaps may exist and fill those uh, with some new services that aren't currently available. So co-op is a little bit of a shift from our previous ICAP program um, and some other business assistance programs because a lot of programs focus on those early stages of the funnel and emphasize that initial connection and engagement with businesses. But at the end of the day, it's hard to know whether the businesses actually got the help that they needed. So while those initial connections are really important, uh, next slide, we'll ultimately want to make sure that the businesses get their needs met. So that's how we've set up co-op, essentially with this focus on follow through and problem solving for opportunity businesses. So in service of this focus on problem solving for small businesses, our reimbursement model for co-op really seeks to reward those partners that get businesses what they need. So you can see here how we've really broken it down. Um, for business outreach partners, there will be an hourly reimbursement um, for their navigators that they bring on at $15. There's an additional um, reimbursement for every introduction that a navigator makes between a business and a resource. So they'll, there's $50 there, $100 per initial meeting with a resource. So every time a business meets with a resource that a navigator uh, made that introduction to, that's $100. Um, $125 once that business has completed all activity that was kind of predetermined between them and the the resource, um, whether it be you know a course or a certain programming or a certain number of um, kind of advising meetings, once kind of that full um, course of action has been completed, that's the 125, and then 100 dollars when the small business submits an evaluation survey and provides that feedback uh, to the county, so that we can make sure that we're or, you know kind of curating and providing the best services possible to these businesses. And on the business services side, um, because the services are going to be, they're going to vary a lot more from partner to partner on this on the services side, the county will negotiate uh, kind of base rates and other costs involved in delivering those services. Um, but the 
the kind of um, incentive for business services will include $100 for that same initial meeting between the business and the resource. Um, so when they kind of solidify that connection, have that first meeting, um, and then $150 when, um, again, when that business has kind of completed that full course of activity um, that they agreed on together. And then Ali is going to go through the timeline and go a little bit deeper into the application um, so that that process is clear. Thank you, Brooke. Sorry, I was having computer issues earlier, but um, I'm hopping in from my phone. So, um, so applications open as of last week on March 21st. Um, last date for Brooke to answer any questions um, is going to be April 8th. Um, but the most important date out of all is when are the applications due? They're due April 15. Um, the latest is 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And so just kind of put that date on your calendar for when those applications need to be turned in uh, in order for us to consider them. After that, we will put a board um, together in order to review those applications. Uh, and they will review first the business outreach partners um, partners um, and, and from there they will decide which ones um, got selected and we're hoping to make an announcement on April 29th as to which outreach service our outreach partners got selected um, because we're hoping to have someone from the business outreach to be on the selection committee for the business services um, we're asking all outreach partners to put that date on hold, which is April 28th, to most likely serve in that committee as well. Um, and we're hoping to make um, those announcements of service providers for April 22nd. And if everything goes well, uh, we're hoping to have a launch on May 10th. And so that's the timeline. Um, and I think I just saw someone ask a question and I just think we'll just answer that um, towards the end. But I think the biggest question sometimes is how to apply. We try to make this application more accessible. Um, here is some writing steps. The first one is obviously review the RFA. Um, I think any questions that you have, you're gonna be able to find those answers in the RFA. I know it's a little bit lengthy, uh, but we we try to make it understandable uh, as possible. Um, you're gonna download an application and I'll, I put some slides later on where you can find that download PDF where you fill out the application. And then after that, you're going to complete a submission form and then you're gonna submit the form and that's it. So if Jevin hits the next slide, um, I have a little bit more of a graphic of how that process looks like just because I'm a visual person and I know there's some visual learners. So again, first you download the PDF application, you fill out that PDF application. Once that is completed, you go to the form and you upload all the documents. So the PDF, certain resumes that we require and you click submit and that's all. Um, next slide, Jevin. And so where, where do you find this PDF application? Um, I think something that I'll do once we're answering the question, since I'll just put a link of where you can find the, um, our website pretty much. And in that, in our website, you'll find drop downs. And if you're applying as a outreach individual, um, you're going to click on the download business outreach application. And if you're going to apply for the business service side, you're gonna find it on the download business service agreement. Obviously, if you're gonna um, apply for both, make sure you download both of them and make sure you upload both of them as well. Um, where you submit the application, this PDF that you're gonna fill out, it's going to be in this button on our website where it says submit grant application. You click on that and it takes you to this form. That form is just gonna ask for simple information for us to know who is applying. So just business information, phone number, website of any, and point of contact. And at the end, you're just going to upload the most important things, which is the PDF application and some resumes that we are requesting. I'm not sure if I'm missing anything, Brooke, if you do just wanna fill out the gaps and then we'll just open it up for questions. 
Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, Jevin, is there anything you want, want to add? No. Nope. Oh, sorry, unmute. Nope, happy to answer some questions though. Great, and I see we've got a couple in the chat already, so I would encourage anyone to, if you have questions, type them in the chat and we'll take them one at a time. So one is, is there's a letter of intent required and the answer to that is no, there is not. Um, just submission of the application and all the other documents that are uh, requested in the form, but any, everything that's listed, everything that's required is listed on the website. So if we apply for both services and outreach, there are two applications required. Yes, that is correct. Um, there is a lot of duplication of questions between the business outreach and the business services applications. And so we don't expect you to have an entirely different answer for the same questions that are on both applications, but you will need to download both of those PDF documents, fill them out completely and upload both to the form and submit. And Brooke, I believe Gloria has her hand up. So let me just unmute her really fast. Give me one second. Sure. I think I just sent the request for Gloria to unmute. So Gloria, can you ask your question? Uh, I have a business partner that is going to be providing immigration services, mostly for businesses that are looking to hire people of diversity, what they need to know about the various immigration status. My question is, does that business need to be registered in Utah to be able to provide those services? Since immigration is a federal um, law, based on a federal law. So does that make sense, the question? I think so. And Jevin, correct me, but I think you were saying that no, it's not a requirement for them to be registered in Utah. Um, the focus of the program is to support people that, both businesses and individuals who are in Salt Lake County. Um, so there's no formal requirement, it just um, we'll make clear with our partners that that's the emphasis, um, but there's no, I mean, a lot of the individuals that uh, I think we'll be serving will be people that are looking to start and get bus businesses registered. So um, that won't be a requirement. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thanks, Brooke. Um, sure. One more question. Is there a max amount of funding that any organization can request? There's not a maximum. Um, there's, I think we're basically allotting, Jevin, correct me if I'm wrong, 600,000 for this particular RFA that's going to go through the end of this calendar year, so through 2020. Um, there's we haven't put a cap on how much a business or an or sorry, excuse me, an organization can request. We're just going to take all of the applications and kind of see see where everything stands and based on how much we are planning to um, grant out for this particular RFA, make that determination. So that was kind of a clear as mud answer, but hey, in Gloria, it may be helpful to think about. We expect to to kind of have 10 to 15 max partners approved. So you could do some rough math there to, you know, a, the average contract may be closer to, to $50,000. Um, the other piece is um, in the application, there are several questions about total addressable market. So in market size, so that's going to be what will really help us evaluate all the different proposals, which is understanding the size of need, the cost of serving that need, and the relative impact that can be achieved. Sounds good, thanks. Okay, a question from Liz. If, uh, so there's funding through 2026 with an annual RFA process each year. So we have been awarded ARPA funding for this program to continue through 2026. Correct, this RFA is just through 2022. 
and we plan to release another RFA probably in Q3, Q4 of later th of this year. So then we can relaunch programming again in first, you know, in January of 2023. But Joan, are you thinking that that will be another year or that will be for the remainder of the period? So most likely what we'll do is an RFA for 2022, an RFA for 2023, another annual RFA in 2024, at which point we need to get contracts in place through 2026. So the last one would be a two-year RFA. But until then, we want the flexibility to be able to adjust the program um, so that kind of county procurement processes um, are a bit more rigid than what the private sector or, or other grants might, might make possible. So as we learn how to create the most impact possible, we want that annual RFA in order to create the flexibility necessary to kind of learn and adjust. So it will be one year RFAs until um, the end of 2024, at which point we would do a two year RFA that would cover 2025 and 2026. Okay. And I think um, Barbara had her hand up as well. Do you mind if I just unmute her, Brooke? Sure. Um, Barbara, can you ask your question? Can you hear me? You can. Okay. Excellent. This sounds kind of like an odd question, but we did a, um, a grant through Taylorsville City, uh, a shop local program, and, and Taylorsville City recognized the value of um, access to community resources available through the Chambers of Commerce. Uh, and so as part of that grant program, they offered to help pay for a first time brand new membership into a chamber um, to help give those businesses long term support, not just one time one off opportunities. Is that something that you guys would consider? I mean, it could be something like $100 towards a membership. It could be something that's kind of in line with what you're offering for other kinds of services. but you know, chambers and, and regardless of what chamber it is, offers um, fantastic long-term services for a, an organization. So, so, Barbara, I'd be open to push back on this and further justification, but I would say that that's not going to be within the scope of this specific RFA. Okay. Okay. Apologies, I'm scrolling through. Um, please recap dis distinguishing services versus outreach. Um, so all this will be, is recorded, so you can feel free to go back and um, revisit things that we might have covered if you weren't able to make it in time um, or want more clarification. But the business outreach partners are really those community-based organizations or chambers of commerce that are in the communities and making the connections with the small business owners and understanding their needs and kind of completing this intake process. And then based on their understanding of the needs of that business, making those, you know, direct connections to the resources um, or the business services partners. And so then those business services partners are the organizations that are directly providing that kind of technical assistance uh, to the small businesses. So those might be, um, you know, a bookkeeping or accounting uh, firm or legal services, um, marketing support, maybe it's direct business advising to help them develop a, a more concrete business plan. Um, I think you hopefully get the idea there, but that's really the distinction between the two. Um, there was a mention of March 28th. There, so March 28th is not on our key date timeline, but um, April 8th is the last day for questions to send to me. My email's in the deck, which we'll also post to the, um, to the site and I can share. Um, April 28th is when we'll be having the business services partner selection meeting. And we have that um, kind of highlighted because we're going to, once we make selection for the business outreach partners, 
some of those partners we would like to include in the selection process for the business services so that they have uh, input into those organizations that are ultimately going to be serving the, the businesses in their community. Um, so maybe that's the 28th date that you heard. Um, will you review the scenario of being both outreach and services when the best place service provider to refer an OBE is your own? Um, yeah, this is a, what a scenario we've uh, we've chewed on for a while. Um, so you can be both a business outreach and business services, um, but because we're we're hoping to not have partners kind of double dip because there is some overlap in. Um, some of those milestones where both an outreach and a business services partner are compensated, um, namely the kind of the completion of the meeting between the business and the resource. And also when that, when the business has completed the kind of agreed upon program or list of activities um, that they were to do with the, with the business services partner. So if you are a partner in both outreach and the services side, you will not get compensated for both of, well, you'll get compensated, but only once each time that occurrence um, takes place for a business. Does that make sense? Um, Anne-Marie, you can let me know if I didn't answer your question, uh, but essentially you won't get paid double each time a business, the same business meets with your organization and then completes your program, you'll just get compensated once each time uh, that milestone is hit. Um, so RFA 2022 and 2023 will have some overlap. Um, I think the idea is actually that they won't. We'll just release the RFA in 2022 um, to get to solicit those applications and select those partners and have the next round start at the very beginning of 2023 after we close out or kind of complete this initial 2022 round of co-op. Um, so they should be um, right in succession. There are grants for businesses that complete the process, right? Um, yes, we didn't cover that. It's kind of a small part as mentioned or covered in the RFA. Um, but I believe, um, someone will have to fact check me, but I believe we're offering $100 for each business when they've complete um, what we've kind of called an action plan. So the county will have some minimum requirements um, for, you know, the number of kind of referrals and activities that kind of constitutes um, or qualifies as a, a business or um, an action plan. Um, but we did want to provide a, um, some incentive for the businesses to, to get through the process as well. Okay, still scrolling. Yes, this presentation will be shared, so no worries. Would all the compensation be reimbursement? Um, I'm calling, I call it reimbursement, but essentially, Kind of those additional incentives aren't direct reimbursements there, but it is the county essentially, you know, funding the, the partners and paying them as they achieve those different milestones. Um, but there will be some to get on the services side, certainly some negotiation around um, what costs the county should, re should reimburse each partner for, um, depending on what they're incurring in order to deliver um, the services that, that we're contracting them for. Um, and then on the outreach side, um, there is a section in the application to um, explain any, we don't expect that the outreach partners will incur a lot of um, kind of indirect or additional admin costs, um, but we are open to to understanding if, if, if you do incur those um, and, and want to discuss having us reimburse. Is there a schedule of payments? Um, it will be monthly. Um, once we select all our partners, this will be part of the launch and orientation session. Um, but we will have a 
a monthly schedule where we will have our partners send an invoice to the county um, based on obviously hours worked by um, on the outreach side, the navigators or staff on the services side, um, and then any additional milestones um, that are um, noted in the reporting and validated that way. Um, so an invoice that will have all the hours, all the eligible additional payments, and then the county will um, pay those invoices. Will we submit invoices for our navigators and or service providers? And okay, I think I just answered that as well. Um, so monthly invoices that will include hours uh, worked by navigators or service provider staff and we'll pay those monthly. I th think that's all I've got so far in the chat. I don't see any additional hands raised. And if you have any more questions, um, again, as Ali said, please review the RFA. There's a lot in there. I know it's um, long and in certain places dense. We did our best to, you know, make it as kind of legible and um, you know, easily consumable as possible. But um, we're also here. You can feel free to email me any questions. Um, as you go through, if anything comes up and wasn't answered here, or you have a certain scenario um, that you're curious about. So, hold on, there was another chat. Payments for the outreach navigators are to the organizations, or are we required to pass them to the employee? The, organiz the partner organization will invoice the county and the county will pay the partner organization. We will require that. Um, well, Jevin, actually, I guess this is a question. If there's a minimum that beyond the fifteen dollars an hour that we're requiring the partner pay to the navigator, if it's just that fifteen dollars, or if it's eighteen, like we've previously, or it's fifteen. So that's the, the $15 base compensation that we set in there is just to make sure that nobody makes less than $15 an hour. Um, but the partners all need to figure out their own compensation schedule. Whether you pass all or some portion of the performance incentives to the navigators, the goal here is to make sure that those, that base pay in the performance incentive payments cover all of the expenses that would be incurred um, by participation in the program. So what I want to I want to highlight there that um, there are some admin expenses. We may, depending upon how you know every partner is allowed to submit for admin or indirect costs. Um, the expectation though is that the amounts provided in the performance incentives and everything else can essentially cover that. So when you ask, if you ask for admin costs or indirect costs, there should be a justification in there for why the proposed reimbursements schedule does not um, fit that kind of, uh, how you incur those costs. And Brooke, jump in there if I was, if I didn't respond clearly. Uh, no, I think it's that, we will require that the partners pay their navigators $15 an hour um, on the outreach side, right? I'm speaking purely on outreach. And then for all those additional kind of incentive payments, it's up to the partner to determine um, how much they want to kind of pass through to those navigators. Um, on the services side, I think that will be on a much more partner by partner basis. And um, so that will just be individual conversations um, and agreement on on what ultimately will be the minimum for staff on the services side. Can we use existing staff? Yes, definitely can use existing staff. We ask in the application, there's a um, 
we ask that you upload any resumes for individuals that you are thinking you might want to be a part of co-op, um, either as a navigator on the outreach side or as a, you know, supporting the businesses if you're a, a business services partner. Um, we just ask that, you know, obviously the intention of co-op is to, you know, expand or scale uh, activities. And so we want to make sure that if there is existing staff being used, that this is, um, that they are focused on co-op and this is kind of in, or boosting their capacity or at least the organization's capacity to take on additional um, volume of businesses and support um, as opposed to simply having the county fund activity that would otherwise already occur. I hope that makes sense. Um, and not, again, not that these activities need to be new or different, but it needs to be scaling up your uh, capacity to do that. For the reimbursement, would the $15 an hour be reimbursement to? So we are, maybe I'm not understanding the, maybe I'm getting hung up on the reimbursement um, firm, but we will pay $15 an hour base for the navigators. Um, as well as any additional incentive payments that the uh, that the partner qualifies for um, based on activity that's reported in our system. So I hope that's clear. And Gloria, if you have more questions, um, feel free to let me know. Um, all we will there will be a single invoice per month from each partner that will include the hourly figures as well as the incentive payment numbers. And we will work with partners to make sure that they have complete visibility into uh, what those incentive payments are each month for them so that they know what to invoice the county. Hey, and Brooke, if I can jump in there for just a second. Yeah. Gloria, uh, for the $15 an hour, that is actually upfront. That's not a reimbursement. So, and um, if you look in the RFA, it's it's clear that we say, we want to pay that amount upfront based upon the expected number of hours that would be worked. And then we can prorate that and adjust future months if more or less hours are worked. Um, whereas the performance incentives are paid after um, the action is performed. Okay, yep. Sorry, Laura, I misspoke. We'll pay in advance for projected hours and we'll pay retro or we'll pay um, will reimburse for the um, additional incentive payments. So hours will be forward looking, incentive payments will be based on your actual performance for the previous month. And I think Anne Marie Brooke had her hand raised, so let me just unmute her. Anne Marie, can you ask your question? questions? But the one I just put in the chat is. Will all of the co-op navigators be trained together so they're all on the same page and have the same information about all the service providers? I kind of feel like yes. they might be a cool team, a team effort, even though they're employed by different partners. Totally. Yep. That's absolutely the uh, intention. And that is the the co-op program orientation that's scheduled on May 10th. So we do ask that partners, if you apply, um, kind of hold that date for yourselves and anyone that you're hoping to have involved in co-op on behalf of your organization. Because um, absolutely, we do want to get everyone in the room together, make sure there's um, kind of the same information sharing, um, idea exchange, and get people get those relationship built. Um, between, you know, the outreach partners and the business services partners too. So um, you got it. Thank you. And I do have a follow-up question because I'm full of questions. But the other thing is I see, you know, there's things that happen that trigger, you know, uh, an incentive. And do we invoice you? Is that how it works when we're getting reimbursed or paid for the um, for the incentives? So I'm my question is, are we keeping track of, I mean, of course, we're going to keep track of that, who we've seen, who, what they've accomplished, if they've met their goal or not, but is there any way for you to have 
I mean, are we providing updates for you or is it just the invoice tells you where we're at with that person? Is there any shared CRM or shared, I don't know, is there reports back to you besides invoices? Yes, uh, we ha have built and are building out a mechanism for our navigators and business service partners to go in and provide those updates on the status of different referrals so that we know exactly where business is kind of in that pipeline. And we'll make sure that all the partners have direct visibility into that and can, and we will provide them the numbers that they can then go back and validate themselves through the reporting that they're inputting right into the system. But we'll kind of consolidate for this, for the purpose of the monthly invoices, you know, a list of, okay, here's how many, um, you know, successful introductions were made by this partner. Here's how many initial meetings were completed. And so then that will total up all of the kind of eligible um, additional compensation that that uh, partner should receive that month. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think this is really great. So if I'm if I'm thinking about correctly, we have access to it. That's where we upload or add information so that everyone is clear on where, who we're serving and where they're at. Um, and then that. So does anything trigger us to create an invoice, or is it just we have to go in and, and check it? Uh, we probably we would already know who we're working with, but just utilizing that um, system itself when it comes to invoicing. Yeah, I think, and this is something we can work with our partners on. There's probably, I think, I'm almost sure there's a way we could trigger something in the system to send out an automated email to the partners to say, okay, it's uh, time for that monthly invoice. Here's, here's everything that needs to be put into it. Love and it. therefore, here's how much you should be invoicing the county for this month. I really think that's awesome. <laughs> Because it would be yeah. nice to be like, okay, mine matches up with yours, and we can go ahead and cut, you know, the invoice. Thank you. That was a really great answer. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Are navigators independent contractors or employees? I think that's ultimately up to the partner um, to just determine what the relationship is between them and the navigators. Um, we, as the county, will. Again, like we've said, uh, pay upfront for their hours, um, and then reimburse the partner for for those kind of bonus payments. Um, but kind of the arrangement between the partner and the navigators, I think, is ultimately up to the partner organization. And I think we've had both. If we had both for ICAP, yeah. Um, so I think it's just it's preference, um, whatever arrangement works best for you. Um, are there max on hours an outreach navigator can be scheduled? And are you thinking we would hire them part time or if we think full time would be needed? Is that okay? Um, I don't think there's a maximum on hours. Um, I think any partner would just have to be mindful of whatever of not to exceed grant amount we agree on um, at, you know, when we, when you're brought on as a partner. Um, and if it turns out that, you know, your organization is doing a lot more work than you initially anticipated, we can continue to have those conversations and um, potentially adjust funding. But I don't know that we're putting any sort of cap on hours for either navigators or staff. Um, and again, I think part time as for your question on part time versus full time, um, I think that's again up to the partner to determine what, what arrangement works best. And just to reinforce that, every partner will have a not to exceed contract amount. So let's say your not to exceed contract amount is $30,000. Anything billed against that, whether it's the $15 an hour base pay or the performance incentives, will count toward that not to exceed amount. So however you hit it, you hit it. If the performance incentives aren't achieved, then someone might underperform toward their contract amount. So if a contract amount of $30,000 is agreed upon, 
but only five thousand or ten thousand dollars of work is done, then that's the amount that would be paid. So you slowly just work toward that not to exceed contract amount. Okay, will the applicant receive assistance during the application process? So, I, you are welcome to send questions related to the application to me, um, and I'll do my best to answer them. In terms of assistance, we're, I mean, that we're not allowed to help any applicant with directly with their application. I can't provide any advice. Um, on what you should or shouldn't include in your application or anything like that. But I, of course, am more than happy to answer any um, kind of more technical questions about the application or the process. If we state we will dedicate 20 hours per week for this program, you will pay us. $300 per month in advance. Um, yes, we will pay for whatever you uh, project to be your staffs. If, if you're on the outreach side and you're um, talking about navigators and um, you're projecting that they will work 20 hours per week, well, actually it would be $300 per week though, right? Um, so we will pay in advance for whatever hours you are projecting your navigator will work for that month. Um, I hope that makes sense. It's a little bit confusing that we'll, we'll pay for your projected number of hours for that navigator, but we'll pay for whatever you are um, eligible for in terms of uh, your performance over the last month for those milestone payments. while you're um, scrolling through the questions, um, one of the questions in the PDF, um, it's going to ask how many navigators are you going to hire? And you have to answer that question by full-time employees. So if you're planning on hiring a part-time employee, that'll be a 0.5. And if you're hiring a full-time employee, that'll, that will be a 1.0. So if you're hiring one and a half, that'll be one employee full-time and the other one is another employee um, part-time just a clarification maybe in language that we have on the on the pdf application yeah and 1.5 would also be if you had three half-time employees um so it's noted in the application but um something to just be aware of that we're trying to for the sake of consistency and um, comparability keep everything in terms of ftes um, since compensation may look different between partners, would would we ask our outreach navigators not to discuss or share their compensation with our outreach navigators employed by another business outreach partner? Uh, that probably would be a good idea. Um, uh, I think ultimately, and this is how ICAP has worked, we we've paid um, a certain amount per hour that is intended to include indirect and admin costs, um, but required partners to pay a minimum amount to their um, navigators. But ultimately, it was up to the discretion of the partners to determine how much at the end of the day they were paying their um, their staff on an hourly basis. So. Um, yeah, I, we recognize that may be different because every organization um, has different expectations um, or kind of standards for compensating their staff. So it may be different. Okay. Oh, one more. Do we estimate navigate hours on a monthly basis or for their contract, entire contract period? Um, I think in the application, we ask for a monthly estimate. Is that right, Allie? I believe so, yes, monthly. Yeah, because I know it can be really 
difficult to ask for a number of hours for, you know, several months. And so I think we were um, trying to boil it down to having applicants estimate how many on average their, how many hours on average their navigators would work um, in a month. So that was um, just with the intention of helping helping with some better and hopefully more accurate estimates. Um, and we and we acknowledge these will change. Um, this is new program for us and for many of our partners, it will be new activities. And so it's, it's hard to say, but um, so we'll do our best to be flexible um, and take that into consideration as we're figuring out funding amounts uh, and working with our partners. We'll just continue that conversation and, and make sure that our partners have the funding that they need um, to support their staff who are who are doing doing this work. Um, but for the sake for the purposes of invoicing, when you invoice the county, you will estimate the hours that that or that your navigators for your organization will work for the upcoming month, and the county will kind of prepay uh, for that. Uh, Gary, I hope that answers your question, but feel free to follow up if not. Okay, I've reached the end of the chat. So uh, again, thanks thanks for taking the time. Um, appreciate your interest in being part of co-op and please feel free to send me an email if you have any additional questions, especially as you're going through the RFA and the applications, uh, there's a lot there. So I'm happy to answer your questions there. And uh, yeah, we look forward to getting your applications and we're really looking forward to this program. Um, we've seen a lot of great success through ICAP over the last uh, 11 or 12 months. And so we're really, really thrilled to be able to continue this um, with co-op. So thanks again for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day.